Are you afraid of the dark? We keep the light burning. The critics are calling Pitch Black the scariest sci-fi movie in years. Pitch Black rated R. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cinemarcade. This is the podcast about movies, video games, and the sparks that fly when those worlds collide. I'm Steve Gutley, the man with the shiniest eyeballs in town, and uh, we are here today to talk about the movie Pitch Black and the video game Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay. This is a huge one for a lot of people. I'm very excited to get into it. Uh, who here is? Uh, who here joined me today? Words good. Who is here with me today? Uh, Hi, I am William, but instead of going by Bill, I go by Johns. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, I think it's his last name, right? It is his last name. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, Bill John but, does not does sound like a made up. Name. And I do large quantities of uh, morphine. Yes. Right. Right in the <laughs> eyes. Yeah. Right in the eyes. Because I think that's how morphine works. <laughs> Look, I'm not the captain. Um Jay Baron, <laughs> already resisting the the captaincy that we're always trying to foist okay. upon you. Uh, and we are joined by a special guest today. Please say hello, special guest. Hello, hello. I am J B C. Yeah, call, you can just call me Joey Chasey. You know what I found <laughs> out that uh, in my research, uh, what I found out that the B stands for in Richard B Riddick stands for Bruno. But we don't Bruno. talk about that. We don't talk we, about yeah, it. We, yeah. No, we can't do it. It uh, makes me think a, less of him that I know that long standing fact that somehow everyone thinks that Vin Diesel is Italian. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. He puts off a very Italian kind of vibe. Yeah. And he's very he's a very New York guy. And similarly, like, yeah, you know, he's he, he's one of those guys who can like kind of fit into almost any slot. Like you're not really sure like where to cast him, uh, but he can kind of play a little bit of everything. He's also one yeah. of those. I'm, I'm excited we get to talk about Vin Diesel today. I think he's a fascinating movie star. Every once in a while, somebody will get really, really famous just by dint of being completely unlike anybody else. Like, you can't really fit, like, you, you can't say Vin Diesel is like a great actor or like, you know, it, or anything like that, but he fits such a specific genre he's a, such a specific guy and nobody else can really do exactly what he does and i think this movie is a really good like early showcase for what he kind of has to offer as a movie star uh and it's it's gonna be a lot of fun to dig into but this is also one of the video games that i think has been most requested that we talk about this one is usually talked about like in the top five uh when you're talking about game adaptations of movies you know in terms of ones that really got it right and uh, this is also a, a real interesting encapsulation of this era of early 2000s video games that i find so fascinating because they are very celebrity driven there was a real rush around like the ps2 xbox generation of getting major major names attached to video games for the first time it was a brief little period, but for a while, like it was being treated as seriously as movies. And I think that's a fascinating time period. Um, but before we get into that, I'm curious what everybody's uh, experience with Pitch Black is. Have we seen this movie before? Is this uh, is this new one to anybody? Have you, wait, have you done your intro yet? Yeah, I've done an intro. Really? <laughs> I did a while ago. Mm, you didn't mention the starring people because... Did you? Because I was like, oh no, oh no, I haven't done like the stats yet. No, yeah, okay. we're, we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, have, uh, I haven't gotten to that yet, but I had a cousin who, uh, and this might start to make other things make sense, was really into this movie, uh, really loved Vin Diesel, also really loved Limp Biscuit and Insane Clown Posse. So, <laughs> okay, this is where we're, we're getting an origin story here. Uh, and I yeah, enjoy going hand in hand. <laughs> I enjoy all but one of those things. Okay. I'll let you guess which one, but let's Limp just Biscuit. say not the biggest fan of clowns. <laughs> <laughs> not even insane ones that posse up. No. no that's fair. Or Fago either, whatever. Oh yeah. I've never had Fago. I understand oh. it's in 
Fago is so good. I come from Michigan. You do. I was okay. I was gonna. Fago yeah. Is like Fang, Fago orange soda. Um, their um root beer exceptional. Okay. Good. All right. Quality soga. Soda. Soga. Uh, soda. <laughs> You're trying to say so good at the same time. It's quality so good. Uh, get soda. I I'm more of a Fanta guy. You Give haven't tried Fago. Here. I mean, I I might have had Fago at some point, but let me tell you, I've never drank. I haven't drank it in the last decade. Is that available that in sure. Texas? I've never I've never seen I've it. never. I honestly didn't know it was a real drink until just this moment. I always thought oh, it was really? just like I always thought it was just lore for like the juggalos. You know, they have this whole expense, you know, like <laughs> they did like oh. weirdly kind of work it into their whole mythos, right? Like yeah, yeah, kind of like ambrosia. Kinda... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got Detroit. it. Detroit. Um it, it's well, it's from Detroit, is the uh where they make it or where the the company was founded. Yeah. Uh, well, JC, I wanted to ask you, uh, you, you requested to be on this episode in particular. Uh, why did you want to talk about Pitch Black slash Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay? Well, like you mentioned, Vin Diesel is kind of an interesting actor. And I think yeah. not so much like Pitch Black, but I think what builds out around Pitch Black is just a really interesting kind of like encapsulation of what kind of movie star Vin Diesel is. Yeah. So I I came across uh, <laughs> the whole franchise through the game first and foremost, the Xbox yeah. one, you know, the Xbox game. Um, and so that had such an effect on me that I, of course, then watched the Chronicles of Riddick, and then it it could, that was a long time before I even realized Pitch Black was part of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're very different. Yeah. I mean, it, and I think it's interesting because like seeing that this was on here because th that game had such an effect on me and the movie not so much but the game really did yeah and so i'm really excited to kind of talk about the, the film what it, the franchise and old dick be dick himself yeah as a you know like <laughs> as this kind of encapsulation of what vin diesel is <laughs> I, was, I i wish i wish that more time in these movies were spent referring to him as big uh dick be dick i like it really is a very silly name. I don't know. There's something about like Richard is a totally normal name. Richard is the name of your dental assistant or your accountant or something. It is not the name of a hardened space murderer. Uh, but it's just funny that that winds up being his name. Yeah. And uh, B is the second letter in the alphabet. True. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about this movie. Pitch Black was released February 18th, 2000. It's directed by David Tui and written by Tui and Ken and Jim Wheat. And it stars Vin Diesel, Rada Mitchell, Cole Hauser, Rihanna Griffith, and the man, Keith David. I love Keith David so much. I could watch I'm, I am oh. going to go on a Keith David deep dive. I don't know if it should be now or later on in the <laughs> podcast. Do you want to uh, do it now? Let's front load it with some Keith, Keith David. I David. love that, man. Goliath from Gargoyles. Yes. Oh, my God, was Gar was G Goliath from Gargoyles like formative for you? Oh well, I I'm not talking about <sighs> you're making it weird. Um, <laughs> I yes, never said I'm that. You implied that a very handsome cryptid, but yeah. um, <laughs> but I I was too young to feel that way about Goliath. Uh, I I just I love the Gargoyles TV show so much. I yeah. feel like it, it was pure genius. Only only today, as somebody who lived in Scotland for seven years, did I realize today Goliath didn't have a Scottish accent. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He yeah, was like the did, only right? one, right? Did everybody else have a Scottish It's been a while since I've watched it. I remember that show being fantastic. No, I don't think they did. But okay. you can always just kind of assume maybe they were just, they absorbed the accent, the American accent by osmosis. You know, like yeah. being stone listening to the people. <laughs> and don't, yeah, don't be on top of a building. Yeah. Don't be ashamed about your uh, you know feelings, your childhood crush on Goliath. No, <laughs> I'd want to I'd want on Demona. So <laughs> oh my in, god, in, she was amazing. That whole time, yeah, no. acting crew. Uh it was so funny, but because so much of Gargoyles uh was the Star Trek, the next generation uh voices. Yeah, uh, yeah. They were so, so good. Um, but also, Keith David uh, Spawn. Oh, he wasn't Spawn. 
or, or, or he was was he in the animated spawn? Yeah, he was the, the animated HBO version. One. Oh, he's the animated. Okay, yeah, I I never saw the animated one, but um, I, I mostly know. I mean, did you know his very very first film role was John Carpenter's The Thing? Like, I didn't know that was his first film role. But I like, didn't realize I that. Yeah, it, it feels like one of those guys who's been around forever. He's actually younger right, yeah. than he seems. I think he's like 68 or something like that. So, But he's one of those guys who's been for, around forever, has the greatest voice in the universe, and is kind of good at everything. Like He could be an action star. He can be an elder statesman. And then they introduce him in the very last season of Community, and he's fucking hilarious. <laughs> Yep, like, incredible. He is so funny. I absolutely want to make if if ringtones were still a thing, I'd be making a ringtone of him going, "I'm <laughs> stinky." Like it's just so good. It's so so good. Uh, he um, yeah. Uh, I also have a bit of uh, Keith David fanboying to do um, because he was in one of the formative video games of my childhood, Halo. Uh, he is he's the arbiter he yeah yeah he, he played is. the arbiter throughout most of the games he was in mass effect as well yeah and uh he was in saints row which is funny because he was in two saints row games as a character in the world and then he was in the next two as Keith David. <laughs> yeah, he was like the Secretary of State, right? He's the vice get, president. The vice president, yeah. Because your character was the president. Right. Did you guys watch Farscape? I did no. watch Farscape, yeah, back so, in the day. The actress who plays Aaron's son uh, is in this movie. Uh, yeah, Claudia Black. Yeah, Claudia Black. Uh, she's also in Mass Effect, so yes. like uh, as a voice actress. Um, and a I'm major just... part of the Uncharted series too. Yeah, she's also in Dragon Age, right? Is oh yeah, she's she Morgan. Uh, Who is yeah, it? yeah, and she is. I think she's in Gears of War as well. Uh, well yeah, she's she's all over. Uh, I mean, which person to be talking about? Sorry, I missed. This the is name. Claudia Black. Uh, she in she the movie, a... she's the one with like she's got like the kind of cool husky voice, and she gets ripped she... in half by the flying things. Shazza, yeah. I think her name. Shazza, is. yeah. Very Australian sounding name, yeah. But but this <laughs> oh, is a very yeah. Australian movie. We should get into it. So uh, a little bit about this director. David Toohey uh, was one of the most in-demand Hollywood screenwriters of the 80s and 90s. We talked about his very first project on our show, which is a film called Warlock, which uh, <laughs> was a lot of fun to watch. Pretty crazy movie. Um, but he really hit it big with his script for the Harrison Ford movie, The Fugitive, in 1993. That's a perfect fucking movie. Um, he took a little bit of a knock when Waterworld, which he wrote, became a notorious money loser. Uh, we will talk about that down the line. Um, and then he made his theatrical directorial debut with a movie called The Arrival, which is a good movie that got good reviews at the time, but it, it struggled at the box office. Um, that one has Charlie Sheen in it. It's pretty cool. Um, so, But he still had some pull as a genre writer, so when the screenwriting brothers Ken and Jim Weed came to him with their pitch for a film about a perpetually dark planet haunted by ghosts, he was very intrigued by it. Now, one of the important things to note about David Toohey, which you can probably see all over this movie, is that he, had wor he was one of the probably half a dozen to a dozen writers who was working on an initial draft of Alien 3, which we've covered on this show, a notoriously troubled production. But he had this whole thing he wanted to do with a space prison, with space prisoners, things like that. So he folded a lot of the ideas from his Alien 3 script into the script that the uh, Wheat Brothers wrote. And that's it kind of how it's this little mishmash. It definitely feels that way, especially near the middle of the movie. For sure. Like when, it, it, well, even like at the from the beginning of the movie, I feel like it's a very yeah. industrial future, right? It's lots yeah. of like spaceships but there are lots of wet chains everywhere for some reason you know? yeah there's a lot of things that go bump in the night there's a lot of uh like tense moments i definitely as i was watching it thought about that i'm like this feels so much like an alien movie yeah, yeah it's a definite riff you can kind of see, like I said, you can see it very early on and in the ship design which i think is one of the big strengths of this movie it's just yeah. like i really like the set design the the yeah. ship design the guns i like i like how john's gun just has like uh you can see the form of it they had like white paint like, which i guess is like wear and tear but it makes it really oh. like visible in the darkness yeah exactly it kind of it kind of pops off of that you know like just giving a little bit of extra highlighting on it to uh to make it stand out now yeah this movie had a very modest budget this is a 23 million dollar movie in uh 2000 which is a pretty low budget for what they're trying to do um, they shot the whole thing in South Australia, 
And uh, they got a, they managed to get a pretty good, like up and coming cast for this film. So to begin with, we have Cole Hauser. He was up and coming at the time. He had breakout early roles in like Days and Confused. He was one of the buddies in Goodwill Hunting, you know. So he'd been kind of around. He's got a like a gravelly voice and a, a nice like dimple chin, you know. His movie star career never took off. For what I understand, he is on Yellowstone now, which is the biggest show in the universe, and I've never seen a frame of it. Uh, but uh, he's he's on that show now. He's like the second lead on that show. He has another interesting situation regarding Vin Diesel because he's in the Fast and Furious movie that Vin Diesel isn't. That's right. Yeah, isn't he? The, he's the <laughs> he's villain. The main, in the second yeah, one, right? he's the villain in the second in Too Fast, Too Furious, which is the only one that Vin Diesel doesn't appear in. Yeah. Um, so we also have the female lead here is Rada Mitchell, who I always love. I love Rada Mitchell. I wish she had a bigger career than she wound up getting because she was very she's just an Australian actress who's very good at like intense, small indie films. And she was the lead of a uh, uh, Woody Allen movie called Melinda and Melinda which was a really demanding performance from her because the whole conceit of that movie is that it's half comedy, half drama, but she's the uniting factor of both of these movies. And so she needs to be playing like all of this different range the entire time. Like, so in one scene, she'll be like acting opposite Chiwetel Ejiofor and the other scene, she's acting opposite Will Ferrell, you know? So it's a very strange kind of balancing act. And I think she pulls it off very well. Um, but then of course the big coup for this movie was Vin Diesel. So uh, Vin Diesel really broke out in 1998 with a small part in Saving Private Ryan. He's one of, you know, it's a, it's a very small part. If you haven't seen the movie, mild spoilers here, but he is the first of the squad to die. But he still has such a distinctive voice and such a distinctive presence that he kind of stood out. He had another role in a small little Wall Street thriller called Boiler Room, which I know was like very beloved of a lot of uh, uh, guys around my age. I don't think I've ever actually seen it, but he had like a small part in that. Um, but this one, but he was being kind of set up to be the next big action star because he's this big burly dude with this crazy gravelly voice like he could pull it off. And Pitch Black would be his first go as the lead of a film. Um, although according to the director, uh, all three of these main actors all kind of considered themselves the lead of the film. And it was leading to a lot of like ego slash personality clashes between the three of them as they were all kind of like, no, I'm the lead of the movie. I'm the lead of the movie. I don't know. I, th I think Riddick is undeniably like the lead of the movie, especially now that there's this whole series. I, but but I, Fry, Fry is a big like Fry is kind of the heart character. Yeah, I, I you you mentioning that is actually funny because I, I noted I felt it in the mm -hmm. performances like these three were like and I thought it was just a, you know, the script kind of helps that along but you can kind of see them fighting each other on screen and it, also it helps the movie like it helps the text of the movie i yeah. think because it's a movie about like all these very tense people who can't really trust each other and they're in this extreme situation where they're being forced to so they they're all very really, cagey. they have really good argument chemistry they do yeah. <laughs> which i think I is not saying. normally a thing but yeah Johns and Riddick has so much chemistry between the two of them. They really do. They burn up the screen chemistry. I'm like, yeah. and like that's we can talk about that once we get to the game. But I think that's kind of an interesting aspect of the game that you know the movie doesn't get to explore because you know it ends where it ends. But yeah, yeah, we just they've they, I I love that they arrive in this movie kind of at the last chapter of this very long rivalry where they are like they're on opposite sides of the law but they're equally competent and equally like determined to take the other down so it's just kind of a constant like we feel a lot of that tension right from the get-go and i think that really works that they bring that with it and it's like when by the time we get to the game and they explore that relationship in a little bit more detail it's all like all right we already get it like these guys hate each other but like kind of begrudgingly respect each other at the same time. Like they clearly would not save each other if they were given the opportunity to screw the other one over, but there is still respect there. And I think they play that very well. Um, and really the rest of the cast is a lot of like Australian character actors that are like really good. And I, I love a good like skeleton crew movie. You know, I love a movie where you have a very limited number of characters. You put them in an extreme situation and then the crew gets like kind of whittled down until you have like the last couple of survivors. 
whatever reason, that formula always just clicks for me, you know, whether it's like Tremors or Battle Royale or something like that. Like, it's just, it's always like satisfying. And I think it works really well here. I, I had not seen this movie in maybe, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years at this point. Uh, I'd, I'd seen it when it was new and I liked it. I watched it again a little bit after that, still liked it. And then I watched it uh, last night and yeah, this movie kind of rules. It's really fun. Like it's a, it's a solid, like across the board B movie, but like in the sense that you used to mean in the old days where it's just like, we're not necessarily going to give you something that's crap. Like this is a movie that's very well made and very stylish. It's just really savoring in all these kind of B movie energies. You know, it feels like it's an old pulpy sci-fi. It's an old film noir. It's an adventure movie. It's a, it's a prison break movie. Like it's all of that stuff. I really feel it's so interesting because like when this when I first saw this movie, like it was very big in my family. We loved watching it together. Uh, there's a big like crossover of sci fi and horror. Um, and it's just so interesting trying to rewatch it because uh, I was I was trying to like I was trying to check my snarkiness because mm. this movie is objectively awesome. But at the same time, the CG is really bad. It looks like they um I've never heard of a white balance in the entire history of the world. But at the same time, I really like the fact that they take uh, steps outside their comfort zone to shoot a planet uh, in different light. Uh, because yes. everywhere always looks like planet Earth. And I feel like Pitch Black does a really good job of making their alien planet look like an alien planet. And, uh, and I really admire that. But at the same time, it's super annoying. Oh, so. at, at this point, we're, yeah. we're nearly 25 years on from this movie, and now I'm looking at it as one of the two or three movies that can really, like, if you need to point to a movie and say, this is what the early 2000s looked like, <laughs> this is specifically what the year 2000 looked yeah. like, you could point to this movie. This movie looks like a Papa Roach video, but I'm weirdly yeah, saying it's... that I'm weirdly saying that as a compliment. Like, it's, yeah, it's a fun, almost like time capsule of this era, which is often like sort of ill-defined, right? You think, oh, if you think of '90s, like images come to mind. You think of '80s, images comes to mind. But if you think of early 2000s, it's a little bit more nebulous. But this is one of those movies that really says, oh yeah, no, we have changed a lot you know, in 20 so years. That, in fact, yeah. Uh, this this movie, uh, the production company was Interscope. Mm -hmm. uh, guess who else is associated yeah. to Interscope? Okay, uh, somebody who likes to keep rolling, 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 rolling. Uh, I imagine Papa Roach mm -hmm. and Limp Biscuit. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, <laughs> so I, I got to bring Limp Biscuit into this one, so we got there. But also, it was just so funny how you said Papa Roach, and I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then, sure enough, yeah. Yeah, it's got all these like stretch and squish like lenses and all these different filters on everything. Like it's it's objectively pretty goofy, but it's still really fun because this movie has some it has confidence in its stylization, I think. It's interesting because I mean, you I think it does kind of chill out with that, like partway into the movie when things get dark, but like the first scene of the movie is one of the most like chaotic crash landing sequences I've seen. Um, yeah. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned you like you like movies where they whittle down like crews because they do a big whittling down. And that's kind of like mm -hmm. a big like point, like a yeah. arc for Carolyn Fry's character. Like they she yeah. she ends up like losing like what there were 40 people aboard that ship and she lost most of them. She lost most of them. And she it, crucially, she was prepared to cut them loose. I think that's, yeah, I agree that that opening sequence is really good, both as like a crash sequence and in terms of economy of storytelling. We know who Riddick is, like we learn because he gets the narration and we also just see how heavily bound he is. We know who Fry is, but you learn that she's not just a typical heroine. You know, she's not just going to be like your straight, straight laced protagonist. She has some like pretty cutthroat tendencies like when it comes down to it she is going to she's prepared to let f uh, all these innocent people die to save herself and the members of her crew and that's something that kind of haunts her for the rest of the movie and sort of is trying to motivate a lot of her actions so i think it's really good in terms in in just an addition of being like a fun gory set piece you know like people are getting impaled on stuff and like smashed all around and and battered and uh you know so all of that is a lot of fun and 
I really enjoyed the Riddick characterization in this movie. Like, okay, I have not followed this series all the way through to the end. I think I stopped after the Chronicles of Riddick movie, which I, I, I remember like somewhat fondly. It probably wouldn't age very well now, but I, I was definitely, it was definitely a flop when it came out. That movie was a big bomb. Being, uh, um, I think it made its budget back, but as, it was a stupidly high budget. It, it was like 120 million. Uh, and it was so different from Pitch Black. I really enjoyed it because, like, I like I'm a I'm a sucker for sci-fi. Yeah. So, like, I love the world building of Chronicles of Riddick. Uh, but it was also objectively probably not that good. But I really liked it. Like, and um. Well, it's it's just Macbeth in space. It's a very yeah. it's it's a big goofy space opera that you don't really get any hints of in this. Which this movie is very stripped down and very industrial and very like this is the worst possible version of the future. And then you get to Chronicles of Riddick and there are like space kings giving soliloquies. It's like, it's very silly. It's very like operatic and big and not necessarily the direction you think that this series would go in. All, all yeah, these things that I didn't finish it, but I did feel that like by, even by the game and by uh, the Chronicles of Riddick, they sort of tamped down the the some of Riddick's more psychotic natures, like he they established yes he is an absolute criminal but he becomes more of like a beleaguered antihero as the franchise goes on. In this movie, he's a kind of a creep. He, like oh yeah, my God, like it's, when he's like cuts off her hair and yeah, we like what is going on? It's really he's good, also too, kind of funny. Yeah, like because okay. there's that. I was gonna say, like, yeah, you have him, and I think it's it's down to Vin Diesel's physicality. He's like skulking around. He's like he's very like lithe and cat like. But then there's that scene, and I think it's immediately after. Um, I think Zeke, I think it's the character, the, the mm -hmm. Ma Maori type character. Yeah, uh, shoots the other survivor who just happens to like he's so. And then you can they do that weird like that awesome zoom to like Riddick just like in the crow's nest <laughs> area, like yeah. sipping on like a drink. Yeah, yeah, just chilling. Yeah. I mean, he, he 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 never feels like you can trust him. Like all the way to the very end, I'm going to jump ahead and spoil the ending of this movie because there's a very shocking moment that happens, like right near the end, where Fry is uh, killed. And the way that the scene is shot and set up, you do have a moment where you think, okay, did Riddick just stab her? And this is like ten minutes from the end of the movie. He's already like saved people and is like come back. But I still didn't trust him all the way up to that very end. And yeah. I think that's a cool way to characterize this guy um, who becomes a little softened as a, the series goes on. Well, I mean, they do kind of like end up in different like I mean, because like what, five minutes before that, like you have him trying to tempt Fry to abandon everyone. Yeah, um, yeah. And he's he's more intrigued by the fact that she doesn't want to, you know, and so he's he's never he never becomes a heroic figure. Like at best, he's going to do some good things because he's curious. He, he He's kind of observing human nature in a lot of ways. I do think it's really interesting because it shows like there's a combination of cheesiness. At the same time, you see Vin Diesel's star power uh, of if, in this character. Yeah, because he there's so many of these like. I'm talking at you slowly and what really? And he moves his head and he bobs his head back and forth. And like, like he, he I feel like he plays, uh, there's a lot of uh, Jurassic Park in this movie, but I yeah. feel like Riddick plays a little bit of a raptor in this. Yeah, he um, absolutely does. Yeah, yeah. He's, you know, we should mention if you haven't seen the film or, or played the games or anything like that, Riddick's special ability is that he he had this procedure called eye shining where he had his eyes basically polished so that he can see in the dark. It also means that he can't really see anything in the light and this planet that they've landed on has three suns. So they feel like he's like fairly neutralized for the most part. But then of course all of the suns set and uh, the world is overtaken by these big nocturnal monsters that will rip you to shreds and it becomes this actually, battle for survivor. Actually, Steven, it's an eclipse. Uh, oh, it's an eclipse. Planet. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, like, uh, wait, but they have three suns on this planet. Yeah. So it like, happens every twenty-two years. Like I guess cicadas. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. They they crash landed at the exact wrong time. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah. But it is. 
it is kind of one of those plot contrivances that ultimately you know like it's just like oh okay we happen to be on a very dark planet good thing we happen to have this really highly trained killer who can see in the dark like it's a <laughs> bit of a plot contrivance and like it doesn't feel super important to the franchise going forward at least is not as far as i can remember but sorry justin you were going to say something no i i want to point out that uh he can see okay in the sun because he has a pair of goggles to wear oh that's true uh, very steampunk like special looking, yeah. uh very early 2000s goggles but then also like what the fuck's the deal with the the cover of this movie the uh with the the home video cover with just like the up close up of his face or the poster of like the the, the black and white uh the one like of his thermal face. imaging it just looks weird it's the, the bio, it's the <laughs> alien's oh. vision it's like it's super what it's uncanny valley it's probably like just early photoshop like back when they were uh, yeah yeah just kind of like mangling every single uh the dvd cover um but yeah it, it's i don't think i've seen the cover of this in a while i'm looking this up it's the one where it's like the he's like uh you see like it's black and white right i think it's meant to mimic the no not the, the black and no. white one oh There's you a, think of the okay so you yeah i see the one you mean like yeah it, it looks kind of like the cover of like an old sci-fi novel or something yeah yeah it, it looks it's, like something somebody drew and it's very a heavily person. very poorly yeah. uh photoshopped yeah so it's it's a little rough looking but i mean there there are a lot of elements of this movie that have aged kind of poorly but the smart decision that they make here i think they realize that they are doing cgi on a budget and so these creatures are mostly in the dark like in appropriate to the movie or if you're seeing them you're seeing them through like riddick's vision which is a very stylized like kind of purple night vision thing so yeah. we get glimpses of them we see that they have kind of like cross-shaped heads and like big gaping like sharp pointy mouths and uh they are allergic to the light which is bad luck for them having you know grown on a planet with three suns that only uh go away every 22 years like it doesn't seem likely that this species would be thriving as they are but hey aliens science fiction go for it I mean, but, it kind of seems like they stripped that planet bare, right? Because you're yeah. there's several sequences where they're like walking through like the bone, like an elephant graveyard, but they're like not elephants, but they're just like these large bones, just they've been stripped clean of any flesh. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, it, but all of this is still very fun. Like it, it reminds me in a way of uh, it's not quite as jarring of a shift, but it does remind me a little bit of From Dust Till Dawn. You know how the first movie, the first half of that movie is very, very, very different than the second half of that movie when they just very suddenly introduce monsters. Um, and that's, it's kind of a similar energy here, uh, but this like, one is more consistent. As I a feel like this whole. is, uh, does a really good job of introducing characters that have their own thing. Uh, yeah. And I feel like a lot of horror movies and a lot of, uh, and then um, uh, those types of movies, uh, don't have very characteristic, but uh, they do very, like, I like the idea of um, a Muslim uh, going on pilgrimage, so they're mm. going to Earth. Uh, this other guy, the rich guy, I, I always get annoyed with, like, uh, if you're intelligent, you're clearly going to get everyone killed. Yeah. Like, like, I've always hated that trope. I'm like, fuck you. Um does he, yeah, yeah, especially it's like this guy, he, he's a, he's he's an antiquities dealer. And so his whole preoccupation is trying to get all of these valuable antiques from the shipwreck and like preserve them, you know. But I feel like he they were kind of setting him up to be sort of like the cowardly turncoat character because all of these movies need one cowardly turncoat character. And he never really became that. He, he became yeah. more like uh, there's more pathos to him in the end. Yeah, he was a little more annoying, but he was volunteering some of his supplies to to get through. Yeah. Well, I think Johns was the one who turned into the turncoat figure. Kind of, um, yeah. Because yeah. he wanted to betray the people um, and use them as bait. Uh, so, but yeah, I thought it was really funny when he was like, I never even got to go to France. <laughs> That was, yeah, that was like yeah, he's like, yeah. Yeah. Now he breathes fire. That was cool. That was yeah. Crazy. He got a nice little moment there. You know, I yeah, I, I think these are all pretty well fleshed out, like little genre stock characters in a way. You know, like there's there's of course the uh, the the young ragamuffin stowaway who shocker turns out to be a woman. You know, but uh, 
which which was it that's a uh, that's a twist i think that we're going to see less and less of as our conversations about gender become a little bit more nuanced you know i think uh, we're we're going to stop really messing with that idea but it does sort of come into effect later in the film because they realize they're being hunted because it's smelling blood and so it's like it's one of those things but uh you know it's still one of those reveals that i think is uh one of those tropes that i think is going to go the way of the dodo in a way yeah. And that character is kind of interesting because, I mean, she, spoiler, uh, she does come back in the Chronicles of Riddick. Um, and yeah, I, she and does. I, Different actress. But yeah. yeah, but I, I'd argue that. Um, so between this movie and the Chronicles of Riddick, they did release like some animated um, yeah. movie called Dark Fury. Right. The director of the the guy who used to do the the anim- the Aeon Flux animations. Oh yeah, and he did some yeah. stuff for the Animatrix as well. Yeah. Yeah. So in an effort to try to be the most prepared guest in this podcast history, I did watch the Chronicles of Riddick and that today. Oh wow. Okay. Um, you're, you're. Yeah, and it, I mean star, it, it's God. good, but like, uh, I will. It's interesting because in that animation, which takes place immediately after this movie, she gets her first kill. Yeah. And it's so it's interesting because you see her like you know she's pretending to be a boy in this. And then she's pretending to be Riddick. And I think it's like, we never really see this character as themselves, I guess. Is yeah. What... Yeah. It, it, there's, there's a fun dynamic of just like this kid being obsessed with Riddick and like, you know, shaving her head to look more like him and just kind of taking on some of his mannerisms. Like there's kind of a fun, like big brother, kid, sister sort of uh, uh, rapport between those two. I, uh, I, and this character was fine until it revealed that she was a girl. And the second it was revealed that she was a girl, she became weepy. And it pissed yeah. me off so yeah. much. You're like, oh, this character, n- now now she's weepy. Um, you know, and um, she was childlike in a completely different way before before the reveal. It, and it was a trap that this movie had been avoiding with its other female characters up to this point. You know, they 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 were all pretty tough and pretty capable in their own way. And this kid was even tough and capable in her own way. And then, yeah, you're you're exactly right. Once the reveal came out, it's like, okay, well, now I'm a damsel in distress, which was a bit of a bummer. But uh, I I was so the one the interesting thing about this movie that I want to talk about in terms of Vin Diesel's career. So. Uh, based off of the, like the year after this comes Fast and the Furious, which is a massive, massive hit. The year after that is Triple X, another massive, massive hit. So all of a sudden, Vin Diesel is the face of three potential franchises. And based on his schedule, he can pretty much only do one. And the one he chooses is to stick with is Riddick, uh, which is an interesting choice. Now, it makes a lot of sense if you know about Vin Diesel as a famous Hollywood dork. Uh, He loves genre fiction, he loves video games, and he apparently hosts like a celebrity-packed, like very high-profile D&D game that's been going on for like 20 years. He did a movie uh, maybe about a decade ago called The Last Witch Hunter that was based on his D&D character that he'd been playing for like a a decade at that point. Like he wrote a whole movie about it and cast some of his D&D buddies like Elijah Wood in that movie. So he's a big old dork, so you can see why this would appeal to him over maybe the more traditionally like uh, uh, heroic uh, macho movie types that, that he was being cast for before. Obviously he would come back to all of these franchises eventually, you know, he, he would come back to uh, fast and the furious officially with the fourth one. Like he appears at the end of part three, right? But he sits two out completely and he sits uh, at triple X out uh, two out completely. Um, and, but yeah, it, it was just a, a weird position to be in where he, suddenly just has his pick of the litter and he chooses this one uh, to develop. And then Chronicles of Riddick winds up being a bit of a flop and some of his other projects don't really take off. And then he goes back to Fast and Furious and that's when his career just absolutely explodes. Uh, So it's just a really interesting career trajectory. And he still has not given up on this series. There is uh, a Riddick movie from 2013 uh, that's kind of like a more stripped down, like, back to basics kind of pitch black two uh more than chronicles of riddick which is going for a totally different vibe and there's going to be a fourth one apparently it's in pre-production right now i think it should be coming out next year and the same director and screenwriter have stuck with it the entire time like so they clearly still care about this franchise even if it's never fully 
penetrated, I guess. It's never, you know, you don't really hear about a lot of people who are big Riddick fans, you know, like most people will like defend this movie. They usually kind of dismiss the second one and uh, they don't really even know about the third one, but it's not really often that you hear people like glomming onto this series. Yeah. I mean, he's not an, uh, you know, he's not an egoless actor. I've never really gotten the sense of that. I think his voice work is the, 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 most selfless he is on screen, you know, He's and I think yeah. apparently I was, pretty difficult to work with. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this movie, I think maybe because he hadn't quite reached the pinnacle of a star power is actually a pretty selfless performance in the sense that, yeah, he's being super cool and all that, but he allows himself to kind of just be in the background. And I think, yeah, he, he does. does cool stuff. And I think that's why I kind of feel like Carolyn Fry is the main character of this movie because she's the one who's making the deal with the devil. She's the one who has the climactic like sequence where she's being tempted by Riddick. Yeah. And so uh, something that I think is interesting is and kind of going back to how how much Riddick or how much Vin Diesel was interested in continuing the Riddick uh, series. Uh, I, I just saw this. Apparently, uh, the reason why Vin Diesel is in Tokyo Drift is because he was paid by the ownership rights of the Riddick series. So he appeared in that film in exchange for the rights so that oh, he has control of Riddick now. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it is absolutely. Yeah. It's absolutely his project. Like even uh, uh, we'll get into the game in just a minute here, but like, yeah, he, he was very, very involved with the development of this game, you know? So it is clearly like a universe he cares a lot about. And I understand like we're getting excited by this original movie. I think this movie has so much is, is just so much fun. It, uh, you know, you, you have to overlook some of the dated elements and some of the, uh, the stylistic elements that haven't really aged as well, but it's a really solid little B movie, little thriller with a lot of fun characters. And, uh, I, the, the one thing that about this movie, that's kind of precluding a longer franchise is that this one doesn't really feel like it has like this whole universe of lore around it necessarily. This movie feels fairly self-contained. So this doesn't feel like a Star Wars or anything like that. This feels like 50 years in the future of like our current world. There are a lot of recognizable elements of our current world. And then of course we get to Chronicles of Riddick and it's Space Kings and, and craziness, yeah. you know. So it's it's uh it, it's an interestingly stripped down sci-fi universe. And like good on menthol cools for like existing in the 28th century. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, because that's what he paid for his surgery with. Yeah. So like 20 packs of menthol cools or something, which some, is a some very number like that. It, it, it's a, yeah, it's 20, 20 cigarettes, which is a, a very important number to come up for the video game, which I think we should transition to because there's actually a lot to talk about with this game, a very interesting Concept. So, uh, the Chronicles of Riddick colon Escape from Butcher Bay. This was released June first, two thousand four. It's developed by Starbreeze Studios and Tygon Studios, and published by Vivendi Universal. This was released on Xbox and Windows, and there was a re-released version uh, released on PS3 a few years after this. So, so like I said, Vin Diesel, lifelong gamer, big old dork, and he founded his own video game studio called Tygon to develop this game. Uh, and they've done a few more games since then as well, uh, some of which starring Vin Diesel. Um, I think and, we've talked about Wheelman, right, Justin? Yeah, like we've, the, we've mentioned yeah. Wheelman on or off the podcast before. But yeah. another interesting thing is the uh, the other company that worked on this, Starbreeze, worked yeah. on the, the follow-up to this, but also made the Payday games. Right, yeah. Yeah, and they're they're a Swedish developer. I think they're they're generally generally do very solid work. Um, and uh, yeah. sorry, one just adding Please. to that is that I found in doing my research earlier today, I found out that a lot of the people that worked on this specific game ended up leaving Starbreeze to found Machine Games, which oh, created the, did, like, the Wolfenstein, the Wolfenstein New Order yeah. games. And yeah. knowing that, you can see a lot of the DNA from this game and that game. You actually really can. Yeah, I didn't realize that that was the same team. Yeah, like I said, Vin Diesel, very hands-on with the making of this game. He lent not only his likeness and his uh, voice, but he was making decisions on like a development level. You know, he's very aware of this time, of the pitfalls that kind of go into games based on movies. They tend to be rushed. They tend to be cheap. They tend to be, you know, just kind of, let's get this out there so the kids will buy it and then we can move on with our lives. But he wanted this 
to not only be to not be like a cheap cash in and he wanted this to expand on the universe itself and this is a really interesting trend that was happening in video games around this time so it wasn't just that celebrities were getting involved in the movies it's that video games were being developed in tandem with the movies to sometimes serve as a bridge between sequels sometimes like uh build out the universe in canonical ways and basically they're they're wanting you to have like if you want the full experience of this franchise you need to watch the movies and you need to play the games and that was an interesting way of approaching i think the the game enter the matrix was one of the ones that was really kind of groundbreaking in that and that game is a mess it's completely broken and unfinished but it was tying out it was tied between uh uh the first and second matrix and it followed like a couple of tertiary characters from the second film uh to sort of act as a bridge between the two and x-men 3 did the same thing like they they do that's the game that explains why nightcrawler isn't in that third x-men movie despite <laughs> being like such a, a popular character in part two they explain that away in the video game so it's a bit of an annoying trend now because I think everybody does it. They don't do it with video games so much, but now the Marvel thing is like, okay, you need to watch all of the movies, plus there are like six six episode TV shows that you need to watch if you need to understand this reference. Or like uh, uh, the Marvels just kind of really throws you in the deep end with that. It's like you need to have watched at least think, two shows. I feel like this is a game was just a really good game. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's, some, um, it's such a fun setup. Uh, it's a really unique setup for... Um, for a game uh, to have an escape a sort of sen- mentality uh, with this sort of desperate escape. Like I, when you talk about um, Pitch Black having um, a, a hallmark back to Alien 3, I feel like Aliens uh, 3, like this is like the Aliens 3 video game, like the Aliens 3 planet, uh, if you will. And um, I really like it. I, I like it a lot. Um, uh, but there's so much, uh, sneaking around and ducked in like, uh, prison politics. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just a really fun game. Um, and also like, I do think it's, um, it doesn't take too long to get a gun, but I do like the idea that in this world, um, uh, guns are DNA based, uh, right. a lot of sense that, um, it, it would make a lot of sense. Um, so I, I really, really enjoyed playing this game. I, yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah, I'll go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, so like adding to what you were talking about, how like this is supposed to kind of like bridge the gap between pitch black and the Chronicles of Riddick. Um, the original version like had that introduction by this character that does not appear in any of the movies except for the director's cut. So mm-hmm. if you open the opening sequence, it's just kind of the, the, the framing device is that Riddick's on this ice planet. He's on, the, you know, he's in on he's on in the sequel at the very beginning. And he gets like this vision from some woman that we never find out who she is. Right. Um, but like midway through the game, I, um, when you actually get the eye shine ability, uh-huh. you know, they reveal that turns out, no, it's not, it wasn't a surgery. It was him awakening his abilities, which I guess <laughs> kind of, which kind of talks to, like kind of points toward like one, it was making currently with the Chronicles of Riddick. And two, yeah. Vin Diesel is a, is a very special boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a very special boy. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's definitely building into the more like space opera elements of the second movie too, right? Like it's we we need a Luke Skywalker. Like we don't just need him to be some thug. He needs to be a chosen one, you know. And for for all the times that they repeat over and over that he spent twenty cigarettes to get his eyes shined, that's not actually what happens in this game. He gets him a music box or AKA a, a boom box. Like he, he was being, it was being told it was a music box. It's a radio. And so he trades him the radio for that. And then the old Rasta man in the sewers, like gives him this ability, but it is like you said, it's, we're not clear if this is a surgery that he's doing and he's hallucinating, or if this is like the hand of God reaching down and giving him this magical ability. So the, the game really does take off once you get the ability there. It um, really does. It's it's interesting. Like I, I was replaying it with these guys uh, and we were, you know, so it, this was one of the games that made me feel my age more than most of the ones that we've talked about, because I distinctly remember playing this game when it was new and thinking that this was 
the most incredible looking game I'd ever seen. This is cutting edge. This is as good as video games are ever going to look. Look at those photorealistic images. And I look at it now and it's like, it, it looks like everybody's made a silly putty. Uh, it's so murky. It's so kind of like indistinct in a lot of ways. But once you sort of lock into that style and you lock into some of the loosey goosey controls of this era and some of those things like, and, and as you advance in the game and get more abilities, you do really feel your character getting stronger as the game goes on. And that's always such a satisfying element. And then really the crux of this game is that it is a prison break simulator, uh, which is such a cool idea for a game that just doesn't really come up very often. You know, I played this game with uh, Ailish called A Way Out, which is like a co-op only uh, prison break game. But like that, the prison break is only the first part of that game. Um, you know, and it's it's a great idea because it it sets you up to like it puts you in a dangerous place. It gives you a lot of puzzles to solve, and you just kind of need to communicate and like uh, uh, sometimes you need to charm, sometimes you need to intimidate, sometimes you just need to absolutely devastate everybody. But you're gonna get out of this prison one way or and the other. You rarely wonder, hey, why can't I walk over here? Because it's a prison. Right. It's a very defined bounds of what you're doing, where you're at. Um, and then the whole point of it is to try to leave those bounds. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, it shows its age, you know, because the, you know, the enemy AI, especially the version I played is 2004. But, but in terms of being a stealth game, it's mm -hmm. a really effective stealth game. It really I is. Loved, I love it being, you know, like you shoot out the lights and they can't see you. Um, so you use your eye shine ability. And the thing that I really liked about it, and I think it actually does that ability better than the movies, is that like it's because it's I guess it's programmed that way. The reflection can actually blind you. Yeah. So like you have the eye shine on, you look at like a reflection or like some light, and the the screen just turns white. Yeah. And, and it makes you feel like, oh, okay, um, this is why this is why Riddick like shields his eyes and freaks out when he's running, and he has that flashlight pointed at his <laughs> face. Yeah. And it, it introduces like both his greatest strength and his greatest weakness as as a character, right? Like, yeah, that's that's the one edge that he has on everybody, and uh, he's good at being a sneaky little boy, and he can uh, he can do some damage that way. But he does need to stay in the dark if he's going to uh, be effective. He might make a good Batman. He would make a good Batman, absolutely. But I think it's interesting that um, so um, from the Chronicles of Riddick. They really have this sort of um, uh, prison um, warden who's like this sort of like high class elite. Um, yeah, it's, it's really I thought that was really interesting that they, they brought that sort of element in from the Chronicles of Riddick uh, instead of having sort of like a, a regular warden. They had like this um, fancy, fancy man. And that's really kind of the only thread that connects it to that movie. Even though this was technically, this was released the week before Chronicles of Riddick was put in theaters. So like you could argue that this is tying in with that movie, but I think it has much stronger connections to Pitch Black than it does to anything that goes on in Chronicles of Riddick just because of the uh, the the darkness and the crawling and the relationship with Johns and just kind of getting to know who Riddick is beyond the little bit that we saw in the original movie. So I think it does make more sense to kind of pair this game with that movie. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's all kind of part of a whole, and it is sort of bridging a gap between the two. I am a little tempted to finish out the series now. Um, I, I haven't revisited Chronicles in a long time, but maybe I'll check that out, and I'll, and I'll watch the new one too, because now I'm playing the game, uh, you know, and it, you do, you fall into it. Like, it's it's a little stiff it takes a little getting used to and it's a little once you kind of adapt to some of the uh antiquities of it you really do get into it and uh it starts to really flow and starts to really challenge you like uh and yeah i, I just I, I feel like it's such a cool approach to take to this game rather than just make it like a straight adaptation i just wish the game was on steam is it not on a steam apparently you cannot purchase it because of a licensing issue oh okay, okay. so I, it seems to not be available through standard monetary means yeah if you still have a ps3 i recommend buying that version so it's um it, they bundled the a full remake of the 2004 game 
on this disc along with the sequel, which is called uh, Chronicles of Riddick Dark Athena, which is a standalone story that doesn't really tie into any of the movies. Um, but it, it's it's an interesting little sequel. that, And that's kind of like where the video game franchise ended, like despite both of those being pretty well received. Um, they just never really took off from a sales perspective. And that's because, you know, the Riddick series has never been really a blockbuster. Like the, the first and third movies managed to make money because they kept the budget small and kept things simple. The second one was a bit of a boondoggle because it was so expensive and they were really like going all in on it. Uh, so like, but there, there's still kind of a tepid response to it. And I don't know if I'm going to become like a Riddick super fan after uh, watching the other movies or anything, maybe I'll shave my head and polish my eyeballs and really get into it. I did realize I am accidentally wearing his outfit because I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, I had, a, I worked out this afternoon and then have not changed. Um, so I am wearing his uh, stylish black tank top right now, man. I remember when Riddick stepped out in a bright red and white, uh, house coat. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, with my ratty little Lebowski uh, sweater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it would probably look equally intimidating if he were to do that. Um, He's got, like, slippers on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, I was really excited to get back to this game, and I am I am happy to report that it does hold up. Like, once you adjust your expectations a little bit for how you think video games should look and uh, uh, square yourself with the fact that we are all aging and uh, we are one step closer to the grave every day. Once you square that, then you will enjoy this game quite a bit. Uh, it really builds. They pepper it with a bunch of like really fun character actors like Ron Perlman and Michael Rooker are doing like supporting character yeah. voices. Sometimes you only hear them like for two or three seconds, but they're there. Uh, and then, uh, oh God, I forgot his name already. And it's definitely not John Benjamin, but, uh, there's a, a lot of times where Bender is screaming at you to, Oh, John DiMaggio yeah, 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 John yeah. DiMaggio is plays, uh, a lot of the random guards. So yeah. you oftentimes hear Bender yelling at you and you're just like, oh. <laughs> I always love exhibit hearing... is a major character yeah, in this game. <laughs> exhibit, yeah, he's he's gonna pimp your cell for sure. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, yeah, it, it, I always love hearing John DiMaggio uh, in games because, like, he has two modes, and it's either like super gruff, badass, ultra military type, or party fun guy. And yeah. uh, that's why Bender is so great because he gets to be both. But yeah, uh, always it just you know, it's it's a. It's clearly a production that some money went into, some thought went into, some time went into. And I, I really appreciate the effort because we'll cover it when we talk about Enter the Matrix, but that, for all their lofty ambitions, they did not support the development of that. Like, you literally cannot finish that game. Like, it, it is... I did. Oh, you did? <laughs> okay, see, I think... I, what, did, what, did, what system did you play it on? PS2. Okay, see, I, I think I played it on the Xbox and, like, there's a glitch or something where you can't get past a certain boss. Like after you kill him, the game just stops and uh, you can't keep going. So like, I never was able to finish it, but that's, well, that's a ridiculous game breaking bug that they should have caught, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, if you, Steve mentioned earlier, if you have a PlayStation three, play it on that. Uh, apparently it also came out on the Xbox and PC though. Uh, remember you can't really buy it on those uh, on PC at least. Um, don't, don't bust out your original Xbox and play it on that. If you have an option, play it on something else. Yeah. Um, just having the original Xbox controller in my hand, uh, almost gives me PTSD. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember when I loved that controller and now every time I every once in a while, Steve dusts it off and we play one of the games on it. And then they tell me to press the white button. And I'm like, why is this located here? Yeah. Like, who did this? And I that's tried the to play controller. Like, controller. I could not do it. Yeah. That's the better. That's the better Xbox controller that you're talking about too. Yeah. That, that's not the Duke. That's the, the slightly newer, slightly smaller one. It's just such a weirdly designed controller, and I'm glad that we have the current Xbox controllers. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but I, I think I'm definitely going to finish my playthrough, and then maybe I'll jump into Dark Athena too, because I think both of these games are only like six to eight hours long. 
Uh, so they're very doable um, and you can just kind of breeze through them. But there's lots of fun little touches. Like you can find little hidden packs of cigarettes with kind of like cutesy art on them and lots of fun little touches that really build out the world. And then Diesel's doing a great gruff, grumbly job with everything. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's it's definitely one of those games that uh, is is sort of the benchmark for how movie to game adaptation adaptation should be done. So I'm going to recommend it. I'm going to let's let's actually uh, move on to our rankings now. Is this a good movie, good game, bad movie, bad game or some combination in between? Uh, JC, how about you go first? Special guest. You can you can make your, oh, make your claim. Sure. Um, so this was like a really formative game for me. Uh, so I'm glad it held up. Um, and the movie, pretty good. So yeah. I guess my my rankings are going to be good movie. Great game. Excellent. All right. Good to hear. J Ban, how about you? I'm going to copy JC and say good movie, great game. And uh, if 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 honestly, I really loved this movie. Like as a as a, a horror movie, pot boiler sci fi. Uh, like, and I I think um, the CGI is the only thing that sort of keeps it from being really really good. Um, but yeah, uh, really really enjoyable. Absolutely, Justin. Where do you come down? Uh, yeah, good movie. Uh, good game. Uh, again, the movie is peak 2000. Uh, mm-hmm. It's uh, I by modern standards, cinematography not great. Um, no. uh, it's just a fun action movie, though. Uh, a fun action horror. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of tension and uh, yeah, very cool. Um, well, I'm I'm gonna come down on as a uh, yeah, good movie, great game. I think I think this the game really in one of those weird ways is going to be the thing that I think people remember most about this franchise. In some ways, I think this is the one that really kind of stands out because the movies are like usually okay. Like they're okay to good, but this was a pretty great game based on a movie and that doesn't really happen very often. So yeah, I'm going to say good, great. Um, But either way, it was a fun assignment this week. I had a good time watching and playing both of these so thank you to JC for being on the show and for bringing this game up on the roster uh, so that I could talk about it sooner. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank um, you for having me. Do you have anything you'd like to plug or any like social media or anything that you'd like to get out there? Uh, no, no. Honestly, just play the game if you can. Uh, yeah. And listen to this <laughs> podcast some more. Keep, yeah. keep listening to this podcast. I agree with you. All right. Well, next week we are doing a Justin's choice, uh, which is, you know, for longtime listeners, every once in a while, we're going to hand it over to Justin and J band to surprise us with something uh, that's completely from, from later on the list. And we have no idea where Justin's going to go, but his last couple movies have been uh, doozies. They've been some real twisters here. So. Straight up bangers. And, and you've, uh, you've been teasing some weird ones here. So I'm excited to see where you have landed. What are we going to be so watching next week? I'm going to give you guys a smidge of a choice here because I can't decide between two. Okay. Do you want me to kick off a mini series of three movies or pick something on its own? Something on its own. Okay. Yeah, on its own. Something on its own is going to be the triple X movie and video game. <laughs> oh my god, we're doing a back to back diesel. Oh boy. Uh, okay. And what you diesel. guys avoided was cars. Oh, <laughs> just because cars two is to me the most amazing uh mind-blowing piece of media ever created. <laughs> I don't know how they made that movie. I don't know how it got approved. It's wild. I don't know I, if you've seen it recently, but I, it's we're we're we'll we'll get into that because that's a movie that I actively <laughs> dislike. So we're gonna oh. be bumping we're gonna be bumping heads on that one a little bit. But it, we can got, save that one conversation. Of my favorites, Bruce Campbell in it. Oh yeah, Bruce Campbell is in that. Yeah, yeah that's true. But in the very meantime, tragically. I love this choice of Triple X, a movie I have actually never seen. Um, so <laughs> if if we think that this movie is soaked in early 2000s, I bet Triple uh, X is going to blow it out of the water. You have no idea how sad I was to discover that they didn't make just like shitty cash grab games for two and three. Because yeah. I, I would have been fine with starting a mini series of that. Yeah, I, I hear the third one is like a good bad movie that I that, uh, you can you can check out and then. Uh, but all right, well, tune in next week, everybody, for Triple X. Uh, be sure to really clarify what you're talking about when you're googling that because Triple X movie is not really going to help you. Yeah, turn to uh, search, John. 
Yeah, yeah, do something like that. But we will see you next week for Triple X. Use an incognito our... tab just in case. <laughs> as our as our accidental little Vin Diesel marathon continues. So, uh, all right, we will see you all next week. <laughs>